Good morning, Potter's Wheel. So last week, Pastor Kevin did a message in our Train to Rain series on spirit-led maturity and how the Holy Spirit wants to lead us and empower us to be mature sons and daughters of God. And that we are all sons and daughters of God when we give our life to Jesus, but the Holy Spirit wants to empower us to be mature. And so today, so today we're picking up from that and going into spirit-led contentment. Can you say that with me? Spirit-led contentment. Because does anybody know that contentment is a huge part of maturity? It takes a lot of maturity to be content, amen? It's not easy to live in that state of contentment. But if we've learned anything in the last couple of years, it's that the world is unpredictable and bad things happen even to good people. And that despite that, God is with us and he wants to help us and empower us to thrive in adverse circumstances. And to do that, we need contentment. So what does that look like? Today, I'd like to share with you one of the stories from my heroes in scripture. And as I do, would you turn to your neighbor and maybe share with them who is your hero in scripture? And if you're in online, please type out who is your hero in scripture. Share with us. Okay, so my hero in scripture, other than Jesus, is King David. Because through so many ups and downs, he always returned to God and he had a heart after God. And I also love that his prayers were just so authentic and real and he was so relatable. So we're going to go through Psalm 73 today. So please turn there because we'll spend a lot of time there. But David sharing about a time where he nearly tripped up. So let's look at Psalm 73 verse 2. And he says, but as for me, my feet had almost stumbled. You know when you're walking and then your foot trips and you're like this, but then you don't fall? you like your ankle. That's the kind of picture I get. He says, but as for me, my foot nearly slipped. My steps nearly slipped. For I was envious of the boastful when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. Can you relate to David's prayer at all? Please don't put up your hands. <laughs> but he was saying, I nearly tripped up and I nearly tripped up badly because I looked to the side and I saw how prosperous evil people were. And then he goes further. Verse four, for there are no pangs in their death, but their strength is firm, as in they're healthy. Um, they are not in trouble as other men, nor are they plagued like other men. Verse 7, their eyes bulge with abundance. Isn't that quite a picture? They have more than their heart could wish. And let's go to verse 12. He says, Behold, these are the ungodly, Lord, who are always at ease. They increase in riches. And then verse 13, Surely I have cleansed my heart in vain, and wash my hands in innocence, for all day long I have been plagued and chastened every morning. Verse 16, when I thought how to understand this, it was too painful for me until I went into the sanctuary of God. Then I understood their end. You see, David was really battling with this. He just couldn't understand it. He goes so far as to say, Lord, I've been faithfully following you all these years and I'm suffering and they're not. Lord, what is the point? But then he takes this confusing thing to the Lord and he lays it before the Lord and the Lord speaks to him. And then he understands. He's like, the Lord speaks to him reveals to him that their end is destruction. And the, he really, really meets with the Lord so that he gets up and he walks out of there ready to follow the Lord, ready to be obedient to him. And he walks up content. But David says it was a close call. <laughs> and I wonder if we're a bit like David sometimes, if we can relate to that prayer. And when we say, God, I look around me, Look how evil people are prospering. They're even healthy. And Lord, I don't understand. 
If that attack of discontentment could come against David, the man with a heart after God, isn't that quite comforting? <laughs> that that attack of discontentment can come against all of us, but we have to be on our guard because it has the potential to really trip us up and cause us pain. You can see how David is even going through a faith crisis, but he overcame by allowing the Lord to lead him through it. And just like David, we can overcome that discontentment too. And God wants to lead us through it and empower us to live lives of contentment. Because regardless of what's going on around us, regardless how undeserving the people might be next to us, it causes us pain and destruction if we fall for discontentment. So today, let's just define what discontentment is. So here's the dictionary definition. Discontentment is a lack of satisfaction with one's possessions, status, or situation. It's a lack of contentment, a sense of grievance. I don't know if you've ever noticed, but a lot of times with discontentment comes this bitterness, that you feel bitter. Um, it says, a sense of grievance, restless aspiration for improvement. Now, you may be asking, uh, but isn't that good sometimes? <laughs> and the truth is, yes. Sometimes discontentment is good, and sometimes discontentment is holy and pleasing to the Lord. And sometimes it's really not good, it's unholy and displeasing to the Lord. So how do we tell the difference? And our first point today is there is a holy and an unholy discontent. So here's the difference. A holy discontent is being discontent with unhealthy or sinful habits or unhealthy and sinful relationships and wanting to make a change. For example, if we know that our relationship with the Lord isn't where it should be and we're discontent with that and we want to seek Him, that's a holy discontent. If, we, if you realize your, your marriage isn't where it should be and there's some strife and you're discontent with that and you want to improve it by going to counseling, by being a better husband or being a better wife, that is a holy discontent and pleasing to the Lord. Or if you're in debt and you're discontent with that and you want to change your spending habits and get out of debt, that is a holy discontent. A holy discontent can also be... Um, discontent with evil in the world, and maybe God has put on your heart to do something about it in a righteous way. That's a holy discontent. And it's always motivated by obedience to God. So holy discontent. But that's not what we're talking about today. We're going to talk about an unholy discontent. And this is what that is. An unholy Discontent is the attitude of being discontent with what God has given us, maybe where he's led us to, and how he's calling us to steward what he's given us. It often leads us to be bitter. Like David, he was discontent that God had given the wicked more money than him, and it led him to be bitter. An unholy discontent manifests as pride, is an expression of rebellion and is a fruit of unbelief. It's often motivated by selfishness and self. And I just want to clarify, it's not bad to have desires. It's not bad to want things. In fact, scripture even says that God places desires on our hearts. So desires are from God. He is a God of desires. But sometimes, even when God has given us a healthy and holy desire and even a promise from God, we can be so focused on that thing and that we don't have it that we can actually resent the present moment and stop enjoying the present because we haven't got what God has given us yet and, that, and become bitter. And that is an unholy discontent. Ultimately, when we're discontent, and I think if we're honest, we probably have all gone through waves of discontent. 
where we take our eyes off Jesus and we put it on that situation or thing that we want and we're led and driven by that instead of the purposes of God. I was doing some research and um, some similes for discontentment are depression, restlessness, envy, unhappiness, and regret. But I've noticed in my life, when I fall for discontentment, that those aren't just similes, those are symptoms that pop up. And I just want to be clear as well, I'm not saying that all depression comes from discontentment because that's definitely not the case. There are many, many reasons, biological reasons and deep pain, but i am just noticed that when I fall for discontentment, that it comes with some companion emotions, the unhappiness and the restlessness, and it causes pain. And so that's why God wants to help us overcome the discontentment. Maybe some are thinking, though, I'm not discontent. I'm just ambitious. And ambition is good. So let's clarify on that one, too. God says in uh, Colossians 3, he says, work heartily unto the Lord. And so God has called us to work hard, to be driven, to be ambitious, to be excellent, to grow, but it's for his purposes. Sometimes, if we're honest, we're working hard for ourselves, for the promotion, for our ambition, for our kingdom, and not always for the Lord. And yet God has called each one of us online and in this room to different places. God may be called you to healthcare or to business or to education. And God has called you to work heartily there, but it's about serving him by serving his people. And that's the motivating factor. And then sometimes the thing is when people work hard, often the natural consequence is that they do get promoted and that they do get increases. And that's good. There's nothing wrong with that. But we need to check our hearts. What is motivating us? Is it that or is it to serve God and serve him well? Because some of our dreams and ambitions aren't always about God. Sometimes they're about serving ourselves. And when we do that, it can lead to the unholy discontentment, the pride, the rebellion, and the unbelief. So if we want to eradicate this unholy discontentment from our life, let's understand where it comes from and what God is trying to protect us from. There are some things that the enemy uses to try and trip us up, like stumbling blocks he puts in our way to cause us to stumble so that we get hurt. We know his name is the father of lies. He's the father of lies. So he uses some lies connected with discontentment to try and trip us up. So our first point today is there's a holy and unholy discontentment. And the second point is about the lies of discontentment. For David, it was this. Look, in verse 3. For I was envious of the boastful when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. David started struggling when he looked to the left and to the right, and then he started comparing, hey, they have more than I don't. And then he started falling for discontentment. And it's the same for us. Discontentment often comes from comparison. Believing, a lie that Satan wants us to believe is, I am less because they have more. And that fuels our discontentment. The grass is greener on the other side. And that can cause us pain. There's a story about a famous South African swimmer called Penny Haynes. Now, she was, I think, a breaststroke swimmer. And she tells about a time when she got into the water at a really important race. And she had trained and trained and trained for this race. But as soon as she dived in, She forgot all about her training, and her focus was on her competitor in the other lane. And so she was swimming constantly to try and catch up with the person next to her. Unfortunately, that made her slow down, and her time was really slow. She lost the race. She didn't even get a medal. But she stepped out of that water that day and learned a lesson. 
she learned she needed to swim her own race. And so the next time when she was in the water for the Olympics, she decided, I'm not going to worry about the person to the left or the person to the right. I'm just going to swim the way I trained, and I'm going to go all out. That's exactly what she did, and she got a gold medal. But I believe that's what God would say to us. If we want to succeed and live in contentment, don't look to the left, don't look to the right. Use what God has given us to do what God has called us to do and swim our race and go all out for him. Amen? Amen. So that's the first lie. The other lie that Satan tries to get us to believe is not just that uh, they have more, so I'm less, but really that I am not enough because I don't have X, Y, or Z. Because I don't have that job, that education, that car, that house, that family situation, I am not enough. And really what that is, is a false identity. And discontentment is an issue with our identity, where we buy into the lie that who we are is ruled by what we have or don't have or what we look like instead of who God says we are. So I'd like you to just think about a time in your life where you really, really wanted something so badly, but it wasn't about that thing as much as about your identity. I'll share with you something from my life. So does anybody remember these phones? <laughs> And anyway, what are these called? Blackberries. They're not even around anymore. But when I was in high school, they were really popular. And I'm so glad you remember them. <laughs> but I really wanted a Blackberry. Like, really wanted a Blackberry when I was in high school. But it wasn't just about the Blackberry. Blackberry had this really cool thing called BBM, <laughs> which was before the days of WhatsApp. And it was like WhatsApp but to BlackBerry phones. Um, and I really wanted this, but I already had a phone, and we couldn't afford this, but I really wanted it. And when I look at it now, it wasn't about the phone. It was that in high school, I felt like an outcast the whole time. I felt like the odd one out all the time. And so getting this phone was not about the phone, it was about being in and being accepted. It was all about my identity. So I don't know what this is for you, what you feel like you need in order to be accepted. Maybe it's, it's the job or the education or the shoes or whatever it is, but this is a trap. You know, praise the Lord, I never got a Blackberry. God never answered that prayer, but it's okay because... He knew that it was an issue with my heart, that my heart needed love and acceptance, and a BlackBerry was never going to do that. And so they will, Satan wants us to build our identity on this. He wants us to build our identity on what we have or what we look like, because he knows that when we start doing that, we can never be secure. Because you know what? There will always be someone who's richer, nicer, prettier, has the latest upgrade, or has a better education, or whatever, and we will never be secure. Our life will be living in this state of anxiousness because it's not based on anything firm. God wants us to build our identity on who we, he says we are. And when David ran into the temple of God, that's ultimately what he came out with remembering that I am his, I am his child, and that's what matters. Amen? Amen? So the third lie that comes against us is I don't have enough. I don't even have enough for today. When David went into the temple, he came away with this conclusion. In verse 25, he says, Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is none, as in there is no one or nothing upon the earth that I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion, as in my inheritance, forever. David realized that he had the best of everything. 
God had given David himself. And that is true contentment, realizing that we have enough, being satisfied that God himself is enough for us. That's why we sing that song, Jireh, you are enough, because God is Jehovah Jireh, my provider. But the best thing that Father God ever gave us was sending his son. He gave us relationship with him. He gave us the right to be children of God. He gave us an internal inheritance. He himself is our portion. And that's why we can sing through good times and bad times, you are enough. It is well with my soul. But Satan would still come against us and whisper in our ears, you don't have enough. You can't make it. You need more. You need a little bit more. When we believe that, we start living with this, I need a little bit more. I need a little bit more. And happiness is just always out of our reach. And so we can't be content. And that feeling of, I need a little bit more. I need a little bit more is actually called greed. And I know we don't like to talk about that. <laughs> and most of us are thinking, we, we don't think we're greedy because in our minds, we believe that greed is an economic thing, yeah? Like, it's a, it's a rich people problem. It's not my problem, right? But that's not the case because just, if a, just because a person is wealthy does not make them greedy. You can have wealthy people who are not defined by their wealth at all, and they see it all as gods and they're generous. But you can also have impoverished people who their whole focus is money and hold money like this, and they, and they become greedy. But if you don't believe me, Andy Stanley, he wrote, greed knows no socioeconomic boundaries. He said, I've met greedy rich people and greedy poor people. Greed is not a financial issue. Greed is a heart issue issue. So if I ask us to all just think, have we ever had the thought, I'll be content when I get the Blackberry or get the promotion or get this little bit of a raise? I'll be content then. And then you get, we get that thing, and how long does that contentment last for? <laughs> Not very long, right? Um, and I think most of us have had that thought at some point, and that is the, the just a little bit more, that is the greed. Because greed actually comes from an old English word that means always hungry for more. And it's not always just a hunger for money, but it can be a hungry, hunger for position or status or possessions or a certain kind of lifestyle and more. Greed is a constant pursuit for just a little bit more and not believing that I have enough when God says, I am enough for you. Look at what Paul wrote in Philippians 4, verse 11. While sitting in prison with nothing except a gift from the church from Philippi to help look after him in prison, um, unmarried, by the way, persecuted, bruised, abandoned, and he writes this from his jail cell. Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things, I have learned to be, both to be full and to be hungry both to abound and to suffer need. And then he writes this famous verse, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Paul knew the secret to being content was realizing that regardless of any circumstance, God was with him and God was for him and that was enough for him. Now, don't get me wrong. I don't believe that Paul was so content that if God showed up and said, Paul, I'm setting you free. Come, let's get out of the prison that he would have said, no, Lord, leave me. I'm so content. It's just lovely in here. <laughs> I don't believe that. 
I believe, like a normal human being, that he would have had a desire to be free. And there's nothing wrong with us having that desire for whatever it is that we're desiring. But he did not let that desire become his focus to the point where he was miserable every day. He left that with the Lord so that he could enjoy each day knowing that God was with him and God could still achieve his purposes whether he was in a prison or he was free. And that's how God wants us to live. So then Jesus warns us in Luke 12 verse 15, he says, watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed because there's all kinds of greed. And he says, because life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. And why does Jesus warn us? Why does he say, whoa, 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 everyone, watch out for greed. Be careful, you don't fall for greed. Well, here's a, here's a tip, a reason. In Proverbs 1, uh, Solomon, David's son Solomon, wrote a letter or wrote this to warn his son. And he says, Proverbs 1 verse 17, he says, Surely in vain the net is spread in the sight of any bird, but they lie in wait for their own blood. They lurk secretly for their own lives. So this is a bit confusing, but there's some people who are setting out a trap for themselves. Why would anyone do that? It was like they were doing something unknowingly that that was going to trip them up. And what was that? Verse 19 shows us. So are the ways of everyone who is greedy for gain. It takes away the life of its owners. So he was saying people set a trap for themselves without realizing that it's going to bring destruction, and that trap is greed. That we, it, When we live with this sense of always wanting more, we think it's going to get us the good life, but actually it takes our life and brings destruction and damage to us and our families. And so this is, again is not about being rich or being poor. It's about if we live our lives for what we can get instead of the purposes of God, it will destroy us and eat us away. So that's why even Jesus gives the parable of the sower and he says that It's the cares of the world that choke out the word of God in our hearts. So God is warning us and he's saying, protect yourself against this greed, this insatiable appetite for more. That's a stumbling block that Satan wants us to fall for, to avoid it, to, you know, if we we may have tripped up for a day, a month, a year, or 10 years, but wherever we've tripped, it's never too late to say, oh, Lord, sorry, I've been walking in grief. Please forgive me. Please teach me how to live in contentment. Because the Holy Spirit, that's why the Holy Spirit wants to lead us in contentment, to avoid the stumbling blocks, to avoid the pain and the damage that it can cause. So if the Holy Spirit wants to lead us into contentment, And if contentment is this antidote to the destruction from discontentment, how do we nurture contentment in our lives? So here are some tips. So this is point three. Contentment needs nurturing, okay? So point one is there's a holy and an unholy discontent. Point two is the lies of discontentment. And point three is how to nurture the contentment in our hearts. The first thing is to give everything back to God, to realize that everything we have, even our own bodies, belong to the Lord. That's why David said, my strength is his. When we give everything back to God and realize that we are just a manager of everything that he has given us, that breaks the hold of the greed the comparison, the false identity, if we just hand it all back to the Lord and say, Lord, my life is in your hand. Show me how to steward it. The other thing we can give is give to others as God leads us. Being generous. Andy Stanley wrote, greed is conquered with generosity. 
And then he encouraged us. He said, don't wait until God changes your heart to begin giving. Giving is the way that God chooses to change our heart. And when I talk about this, it's not just about giving money, but about giving our time as the Lord leads us to, giving our talents, so like giving our skill without expecting something back, or giving our treasure as God leads us to. I've found in my own life when I'm really struggling with discontentment and the Lord then leads me to serve someone, it really helps me snap out of that, like the bitterness and self-pity and helps me to feel the joy again of contentment. So give generously to others as God leads. The other thing that breaks the hold of discontentment is giving thanks. 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 16 says, Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Contentment really grows by thankfulness. Think of the times in the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve, God said to them, I've given you all of this. Just don't, don't eat this because that's going to cause you pain. When Satan came along and talked to them, they lost sight of everything that God had given them and focused on the one thing they didn't have. And that's what discontentment does. And then when they focused on that, it led to the pride, the rebellion, the unbelief that God had good things for them. And they took that and it brought destruction. And so to break that mindset, God has called us to be thankful in all circumstances. And it takes practice. It's choosing to look for things to make us thankful. I remember sitting in my bed once and thank you for my toes. Thank you for my organs. Thank you. Looking for things to be thankful for. I remember uh, one of my other heroes, not in scripture, but her name is Corrie ten Boom. And I'm sure you've heard of her before. She was a, a Dutch woman. And her and her sister got caught um, keeping Jewish people safe in their home during World War II. And they were sent to a concentration camp. And the conditions were like this. You know, it was, they were starving. They were sick. They were uh, treated so badly. It was like hell on earth. And they were in this kind of a bunker, and it was filled with fleas. And in the middle of such a situation, Corrie and Betsy started hosting Bible studies and ministering to the woman in their cabin. And women were getting saved. And it was a miracle because for some reason, the security guards never came and checked on that particular cabin. So they had this revival going in their cabin. And um, Corrie shares, she got out of, um, she got out of there, and she she shares that her and Betsy were when they were still in the cabin, and in the concentration camp, they were having a time of prayer, and Betsy said, "Thank you, God, for this, and thank you for that, and thank you for the fleas." <laughs> and Corrie was like, "Betsy, how can you say thank you for the fleas?" And Betsy was like. God says, give thanks in all circumstances. So thank you for the fleas. And when Corrie got out and she was ministering around the world and people were getting saved, she shares about the fleas. And she shared that the reason why the security guards never checked their cabin was because of the fleas. So those fleas meant that women got saved. So thank you, God, for those fleas. But in our own lives, to be content, we need to nurture that thankfulness and choose to focus on the things we can be thankful for. So those are three things we can give to nurture contentment. Give everything back to God. Give to others generously. Give thanks. But there's two things we can get as well that can help us nurture contentment. First, like David, we can get God's contentment. I mean, get God's perspective. When David ran into the temple of God, nothing changed about his situation, only the way he saw it, only his perspective. 
And there are going to be things that upset you, that you don't understand, that maybe cause you pain. Well, we all have access to our Heavenly Father and we can run into His temple and be like, that raw and honest David prayer, Lord, I don't understand. Please help me. Please meet with me. Show me how to get through this. Get God's perspective. But ultimately, the most powerful weapon against discontentment is to get our identity from God. Like David, he came back to God and he understood that he was God's child. And that was all that matters. God wants us to have that same contentment that David had, that feeling of satisfaction and believing that I have enough. But it takes nurturing. It's something we partner with the Holy Spirit. He wants to lead us in it, but we need to partner with him. Um, to eradicate the comparison and the false identity and greed. Something very important to understand is that contentment is not a place that we get to in the future when everything is going well and we have everything we want. Contentment is an attitude that we embrace today. Dave Ramsey wrote, he said, content people don't always have the best of everything but they make the best of everything. Then he says, contentment is not a place you get to financially. It's a place you get to emotionally and spiritually. It's something we need to nurture. You know, if you think of our hearts as a garden, God isn't going to come and plant things in our hearts without our permission. He wants us to partner with him. And when we have a garden, say we're planting vegetables, we don't just plant the spinach and plant the carrot and hope for the best and leave it there. We know that they need some nurturing, need some fertilizer and soil and checking up on it, but ultimately that God causes the growth. And sometimes we're more intentional with our gardens than we are with our hearts. And we're letting the bitterness just grow without paying attention to it, letting the discontentment grow without paying content, um, attention to it. And sometimes then we just think the issue is, I need more stuff. I need a better education. I need a better whatever. Instead of realizing the issue is the discontentment and let, letting God minister to that and uproot that. Charles Spurgeon wrote, he said, you have no need to sow thistles and brambles. They come up naturally in us. So you have no need to teach mankind to complain. They complain fast enough. But the precious things of the earth must be cultivated. And contentment is one of the flowers of heaven that if we would have it, it must be cultivated. So he's saying again that contentment is a choice. It's supernatural from the Holy Spirit, but he's calling us to partner with him and let him lead us into contentment through giving everything back to him, giving to others as he leads us, giving thanks, getting his perspective when we just really don't understand, and then getting our identity from him, building our identity on him. As we walk out today, I really pray that we understand that there is a holy and an unholy discontent. And that the lies of discontentment that are coming against all of us that, to tell you, you're less because they have more. And that you're not enough and that you don't have enough to get through. To understand those lies and avoid them and come back to the Lord and nurture contentment. Would you please stand, please? And as you do, remember what Paul said in the middle of a, a really adverse circumstance. He said, I have learned the secret to being content, and then I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. The same Holy Spirit who lived in Paul who raised Christ from the dead is available to us. And if we're feeling weak, he wants to strengthen us. If we feel like we don't have enough, that he wants to help us to be content. And so let's say this verse together with new meaning, verse 13, in three, two, one. 
I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Yes, we can live lives in contentment, whether a base or abounding in every situation because the same Holy Spirit who strengthened Paul is here to strengthen us today. All we need to do is just partner with him. So let's pray. And as we pray, if you want to just ask the Lord for forgiveness for uh, falling for discontentment or believing the lies, then would you just pray after me if you feel comfortable? Father God, You are my everything. You are enough for me. Please forgive me for when I believe the lies of discontentment. Forgive me for entertaining unholy discontentment. I repent, Lord. Please teach me the secret of being content, whether a base, or abounding. Thank you that through you, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. In Jesus' name, amen. As we sing this song, I just really pray that the Lord ministers to your heart like he did with David. Just really allow the Lord to speak what you need to hear beyond the words, beyond what I've said. What does God want to say to you personally this morning? Amen.